the Honorable Vice Dean of Social and Political Science Faculty, Head of International Relations Department, Distinguished Speaker, dear ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good afternoon. Social and Political Science Faculty, Head of International Relations. My name is Andy Firmansa. It is wonderful and precious chance for me to be your pastor of ceremony today in our event, International Webinar, The End of Optimism. The program is held by the International Relations Department in collaboration with the Social and Science Faculty of Universitas Muhammadiyah Yogyakarta. First of all, let us say thanks to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala who has been giving us guidance, happiness, healthy, and mercy, so we can participate in this event without any obstacles. Praise and salutations upon our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the best figures of this universe. And a special day, we have the following agenda, and please allow me to read them for you. The first, this agenda will begin with the opening. The second agenda would be speech by the Vice Deans of Social and Political Science Faculty. The next agenda is the main event of the program, International Webinar. The last agenda would be closing. To begin the programs, let's open this agenda by reciting Basmala together. Now let's move on to the next agenda. An opening remarks will be delivered by the Vice Dean of Social and Political Science Faculty. Please welcome Ibu Dr. Yeni Rosilawati, SIPSAMM. Okay, uh, thank you for the master ceremony. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. The Honorable Speaker, Professor Mark Bison from University of Western Australia, and also uh, the Honorable, the Head of uh, Department of International Relations of UMY, Dr. Sukito MSE, and uh, the lecturers of International Relations Department of UMY, the distinguished guests, and also uh, all the audience. Good afternoon. On behalf of the Dean of the Social and Political Sciences Faculty, I would like to express our gratitude to Professor Mark Bison for letting us have you on this webinar. I'm sure it will be a tremendous honor for us, particularly our students, to learn from you. Second of all, I would like to address our enthusiastic students. This webinar is a golden opportunity for the students to learn directly from the masters. I'm aware that uh, many students uh, has registered, yeah, have registered to join this multi-platform webinar on Zoom and also uh, from the YouTube. As always, I'm proud of you and I will encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity to broaden your knowledge in this field. Third, this is part of our response to the Ukraine, Ukraine issue, which continues to this day. Regardless of your positions on this issue, we condemn the conflict that kills people and also destroy family and social life, all of which are vital to the community survival. This webinar is designed to provide deeper understanding into, into the issue's ramifications, giving students more options for dealing with the problem. Again, we would like to thank Professor McBeeson for letting us have you here. I hope it, would, it wouldn't be your last visit, even though we conduct in virtual to University of Muhammadiyah Yogyakarta. And we do hope that we can have more opportunities to have you on more occasions in the near future. Please enjoy the discussions and wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much to Ibu Dr. Yeni Rosilawati. Ladies and gentlemen, now we are at the main agenda of today's event, International Webinar. 
and this session it will be moderated by Bapak Faris Alfadat PhD. He is the lecturer of International Relations Department. He is also Universitas Muhammadiyah Yogyakarta Vice Rector for Students, Alumni, and Al Islam Kahmadian Affairs. He earned his master's degree from Universitas Gajah Mada in 2010. He obtained his doctoral degree from, from the Murdoch University, Australia in 2019. Let's welcome Bapak Faris Alfada, PhD. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mas Andi. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And good afternoon to everyone who are participating this uh, session. Uh, welcome to all of our undergraduate students. Uh, very grateful for today's uh, session. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to Professor Mark Bisson for uh, your time to talk to our students. Uh, the topic for today's webinar is very timely. Uh, it's implication of the Ukrainian crisis. Uh, there are many questions to be asked regarding of the recent uh, war, uh, especially related to three aspects. The first is uh, how the regional governance uh, works so far and uh, has the ability to solve this problem, especially if we are talking about the European Union. And also we are raising a question about the effectivity of uh, economic uh, cooperation. And the last is about the security, whether it's in regional or in globally. Allow me to introduce our dear speaker today. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Mark Bisson is a professor uh, uh, Anjang Professor at the University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, he was previously professor uh, in the University of Western Australia. And before that, he also professor at Murdoch University, Queensland University, York University in United Kingdom, and also Birmingham University, where he was the head of the department. He, was, he is a prolific author in international politics and also politics of Asia. He, is the author of more than 200 journal articles and book chapters, also more than a dozen of books. Uh, his most recent books entitled Environmental Anarchy, Security in the 21st Century, which is written in 2021. Most Many of his books actually uh, have become the source of textbook for the university teachings. Uh, one of its uh, uh, regional uh, which we are using in our department in the subject of uh, political economy of East Asia, the book entitled Originalism and Globalization in East Asia. So I'm very uh, honored to welcome Professor Bisson for today's webinar. Max, time is yours. Thanks very much, Faris. That was a very generous introduction. And uh, I'll just... I mute myself. Okay. I've got a little PowerPoint, which I'd like to share with you all, if I may. But thank you very much for the sure. generous introduction and the chance to talk to you uh, and your students about this very important uh, debate. So let me just see if I can do the screen saving thing, sharing thing. Here we go. Okay. So is that showing okay? Yeah, okay. sure. So uh, I'm going to talk about the Ukrainian crisis. I should say at the outset that uh, I don't consider myself to be an expert on Ukrainian politics, geopolitics, strategic culture, or anything else that's specific to this particular crisis. What I am interested in uh, is the, uh, the kind of impact and implications that the Ukrainian crisis might have for Europe and for the world more generally. And uh, some of the points I'm going to make about this, uh, you, Asian students may not be uh, that impressed by some of the points I'm going to make because uh, you may think it's a bit of a Eurocentric perspective, but I'm going to suggest to you that what's at stake in the uh, problems that Europe's currently facing go far beyond Europe and are really connected with our collective ability as human beings anywhere in the world to organize societies uh, and our international interactions in a peaceful and sustainable way. And uh, I think that's what's really at stake uh, in the, uh, the European crisis at the moment. Uh, 
And I have to say, I'm not terribly optimistic uh, about our chances of solving it easily. But let me just run through a few of these points. I've got a few slides that I'll show you that just organize my thinking and uh, some of the observations that I'm going to make. But uh, the first point to make, I think, is that uh, whatever you think about Europe, and not everybody agrees with this basic starting point, but Europe did pioneer a particular way of thinking about the world, uh, about thinking about us as individual human beings, about thinking about our relationship with the state, and even with God, uh, was something that Europeans uh, have had a big part in shaping modern conceptions of these kind of big sorts of issues. And a lot of this was developed in the Enlightenment three or 400 years ago. And I think that was a very significant turning point in human history. Uh, and in many ways, I think that was a good thing. And there are some very prominent people who were around during the uh, Enlightenment and Immanuel Kant is possibly one of the most famous and influential. And it's interesting that somebody like Kant thought that human beings have a capacity to act and think rationally, uh, and that as a consequence of this, our ability to be able to think objectively and rationally about our circumstances and the kinds of problems that we would like to uh, deal with, he imagined that it was possible to have a perpetual peace that people behaving rationally would recognize that war was foolish, pointless, uh, and destructive. Uh, they would rise above this uh, possibility of uh, trying to pursue their interests through war and conflict, and eventually develop a permanent peace in Europe and by extension elsewhere around the world. And this would lead to the, the real achievement of a good life for the world's population eventually. And this was a very optimism inducing, uh, progressive kind of idea about what human beings were capable of and the direction of human history. And just the very idea that progress was possible, achievable uh, through scientific knowledge, through education uh, and through reform and through things like uh, female emancipation and political emancipation more generally, these were seen as the kind of building blocks for creating a good society that was sustainable, peaceful, and uh, able to solve some of the kind of big challenges uh, that the world face, faced. Now, this may not have been uh, exclusively a European project, uh, but it was developed to a very high degree uh, in European thought in this period during the Enlightenment. And it's found its uh, manifestation in the American Constitution and some of the key ideas that have underpinned America's role in the world. And whatever you think about America's role in the world, those were some of the big ideas that were supposedly being pursued and uh, promulgated around the world by the Americans and others. And uh, I think all of that kind of agenda uh, has been in doubt for some time now, for a variety of reasons, various economic crises, uh, unresolved uh, strategic crises in the Middle East and elsewhere. So all of these things were in doubt in some parts of the world anyway. But since Vladimir Putin has invaded Ukraine, I think this has raised a big question mark about even Europe's ability to be able to pursue the kinds of ideals uh, that were enshrined in the Enlightenment and developed uh, in various countries, particularly in the European Union. And I'm going to talk about that a bit in a bit more detail. If I can get my screen to more, move forward, of course. So it's worth remembering uh, where Europe came from and some of the problems that Europe has had. And when we're looking around the world and thinking about places that have had major crises, nowhere has had bigger crises or a more, more blood-stained history than Europe. Millions of people uh, died in the First and Second World Wars, which were uh, had their origins in Europe. 
uh, and they marked a, a really unfortunate chain of events in Europe uh, where some forms of organizing European power and relations between European powers, particularly what's called the, the European Concert of Powers, where the major countries in Europe agreed to stabilize, coordinate, uh, and use diplomacy to make their internal relations with each other in Europe more stable. That occurred in the 19th century, but that gradually began to break down. And we saw firstly the First World War, and then even more uh, destructively the Second World War. And we had attempts in Europe to try to put some of these uh, big ideas into practice and to deal with the economic and political crises that emerged from the aftermath of the First World War, the Treaty of Versailles, which punished the Germans for their role in the First World War and led directly to uh, the rise of Nazi Germany. Interestingly, there was an attempt to uh, place international relations on a much more institutionalized basis and to put security on a collective basis with the so-called League of Nations, which as they say, seemed like a very good idea at the time uh, and enshrined many of these ideas about progress, rationality, the ability of states to manage their international relations uh, safely and securely. All of that began to fall apart, partly as a consequence of the Great Depression and directly as a consequence of the rise of people like Adolf Hitler, uh, the rise of fascism in places like Italy, uh, Japan, directly undermined any chance of organizing uh, security on a collective basis in the period between the two wars, uh, because it was simply too difficult to do and too difficult to persuade uh, increasingly powerful states like Nancy, Nancy Germany to be able to uh, restrain themselves and not to threaten their neighbors. And clearly there are uh, echoes of that time in what's going on in Europe now and the way that the uh, Putin's Russia is currently using military force and aggression to try to pursue whatever he thinks his goals in Ukraine and elsewhere actually are. But the big point to make is that we've been through this before uh, and we've seen how this can end and what the risks are of not successfully uh, controlling people like Hitler and, in my view, people like Putin uh, as well. The other thing to remember, I think, out of this period of 20th century European history is that good things eventually came out of the Second World War in particular. There was this huge cataclysmic war in Europe uh, in during World War II, which was immediately followed by the Cold War. Uh, and it's worth remembering that there was also a huge economic crisis between the two world wars, uh, which the Americans in particular wanted to try and ensure that wouldn't happen again. Because in the aftermath of the Great Depression and the Second World War, it wasn't just uh, the stability of the international relations system that was at stake, but also the stability of international capitalism. It's important to remember that after the Second World War, many people thought that socialism uh, of the sort that was being promoted by uh, the Soviet Union was actually going to win the Cold War and become the dominant uh, economic paradigm. Now, we know that didn't happen, but one of the reasons that didn't happen was because the United States successfully supported uh, re economic and political reconstruction in Western Europe. Uh, and we had the creation of the European Union as a direct consequence of these terrible disasters that occurred during the, between the two world wars and during the second world war in particular. So what we saw was an attempt led by 
American hegemony or leadership, if you like, to create what's called an open liberal economic order. Now, the Americans weren't always uh, supporters of uh, an open political liberal order, but they certainly were supporters of an open economic uh, order. And we can talk about the differences and significance of that because uh, President Suharto uh, received a lot of support from Americans, despite the fact that he wasn't uh, a liberal leader. So that kind of influence uh, and the creation of various political regimes around the world wasn't just confined to Europe, although arguably Europe was one of the most important uh, examples of a kind of progressive form of political cooperation that emerged as a direct consequence of World War II. And crucially, there were a few uh, important political leaders in Europe as well who responded positively to the incentives and assistance that were provided by the Americans after the Second World uh -huh. War. And people like Jean Monnet, uh, whose picture is here, were instrumental in helping to create the European Union. So this is why the European uh, crisis is so important, in my opinion, at least, because Europe used to be arguably the most violent place on earth for hundreds and hundreds of years. They may make Al-Qaeda and various modern uh, terrorist organizations look pretty uh, small time and insignificant by comparison. The scale of uh, horrors that characterized uh, European history for hundreds of years cannot be overstated in many ways. Religious fundamentalism, rise of fascism, uh, were really uh, profound influences on European history and something that were very difficult to deal with for many, many years. Uh, and the great achievement of the European Union, in my view, is that it has pacified arguably the most violent part of the planet, bar none. And it has effectively made uh, war unthinkable, at least in Western Europe. And it's worth remembering that in living memory, uh, France and Germany, uh, Germany and Britain uh, fought tremendous wars that led directly to the deaths of millions of people. And the European Union uh, helped to bring that to an end. And it's almost impossible for young Germans and young French people to imagine that they would ever go to war with each other again. And that, in my mind, is the most significant achievement that the European Union has managed to achieve. Because if you're all students of international relations, you would know that one of the most fundamental assumptions made by international relations theorists is that states are always going to compete, that security is never certain, that states have to look after their own security, but the European Union uh, turned those ideas upside down and demonstrated uh, for 70 years or so that collective security is possible, can be achieved by well-intentioned states, and war can be made virtually unthinkable. And it's worth remembering that the Schengen Agreement, which, mean, which meant that, uh, and still means theoretically, that many Europeans can travel around Europe without having to show passports and have free travel across national borders, which is an almost unimaginable luxury and privilege for perhaps the majority of the world's population who find themselves living in difficult circumstances where travel, mobility, migration are unimaginable privileges that maybe they're never going to achieve. But the problem now is that maybe even in Europe, uh, these kinds of things are going to be more difficult to sustain uh, and uh, respond to in progressive uh, kinds of ways in the future. So that's one of the key kind of challenges uh, that's at stake in Europe. So as I mentioned, many international relations scholars uh, think that cooperation is simply not possible. And maybe they're right. Uh, and 
if we believe, or more accurately, if policymakers believe that that is an accurate understanding of the way that the world works, of course, that is exactly how the world will work, because it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Everybody thinks security is impossible. Everybody, therefore, spends scarce resources on buying lots of new weapon systems and preparing for uh, an insecure future. So national interests, the argument goes, will always triumph in a self-help system, and we will always find people making arguments for spending more money on conventional weapons systems, rather than trying to solve problems through diplomacy, through negotiation, through institutional agreements, uh, not to behave in particular sorts of ways. And the, the symbolism of the European Union's uh, great achievements will be uh, profoundly undermined if the European Union breaks up or collapses under the strain of trying to manage uh, its existing problems with uh, some of the rise of populism uh, in Eastern Europe and people like Viktor Orban in Hungary, maybe Marine Le Pen in France, who knows? If we get those kinds of right-wing nationalist leaders uh, becoming more prominent and influential in Europe, that will cause problems above and beyond what's happening in uh, Ukraine uh, at the moment. But there is a really major uh, question about whether the European Union and possibly NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, can actually successfully address this Ukrainian crisis and bring the war to an end. We'll have to see uh, what happens, basically. But that's, that's what's at stake uh, with uh, the European Union not just in practical terms, but in what it symbolizes about our collective ability to be able to rise above what many international relations scholars believe is the, the fundamental underlying drivers of uh, international politics. One of the other things that's become obvious uh, recently is that many people thought other international political economy Scholars like Farris, of course, who's an outstanding example, uh, thought that greater economic interdependence would make countries more peaceful. Countries would recognize that their economic welfare was dependent on having good relations with powerful economic actors, and that this economic interdependence would make people think differently about their neighbors because they would recognize that they have to cooperate, because if they don't, uh, then they will find it difficult to make economic progress. And so Cohane and Nye, two famous international political economists, argued that uh, economic interdependence was going to change the way that states behaved and thought about their collective uh, interests. And it did seem, with the creation of other economic institutions, like the so-called Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, uh, and the World Trade Organization, that that process of institutionalizing international relations, uh, particularly economic ones, would have a pacifying effect, would change the way that uh, states thought about themselves and change the the logic of international commerce would transform into state relations. And for, a, for a quite a long time, it did seem as if this was precisely what was happening, that states were behaving differently, were considering things other than their narrow national interests. And uh, countries like Japan demonstrated that you don't have to be a major military power to be a tremendously successful economy and country uh, in the modern era, or so it seemed. And yet, we now see, as this chart illustrates, that Europe has become highly dependent on uh, supplies of Russian energy, 
And if Russia wants to, it can threaten to turn off the tap. It can threaten countries like Germany, which are highly dependent on Russian energy. Uh, it can threaten to undermine their economic well-being. And clearly, this is causing uh, great angst in Germany uh, about how to respond to Russia, how to deal with the Ukrainian problem when their own domestic economic interests are being directly affected by uh, the, out, out, the aftermath of the war or the consequences uh, of the war. So that idea about the kind of triumph of the capitalist peace, as some people have call, called it, looks increasingly uncertain. And it's clear that some countries at least, and some of them are pretty powerful ones, are prepared to use their economic leverage and geoeconomic power to get their own way, to try to persuade other countries uh, to behave in ways that they might not choose to otherwise. Russia is the most obvious example of this at the moment, but it's worth remembering that in our part of the world, Indonesia and Australia, China is the biggest geoeconomic power in our part of the world. And China has also demonstrated that it's very willing to use its economic leverage to punish countries like Australia uh, for doing things that it doesn't like and making critical remarks about the way that China behaves. So I think it's important to recognize that geoeconomic uh, influence and economic dependent interdependence can work in different ways at different times. And they are not necessarily going to be associated with pacification, uh, more peaceful relations and good behavior on the part of all states. And I think Russia's giving us a very powerful reminder of that possibility uh, at the moment. Now, in my view, the problem with all of this, apart from Russia invent, invent, invading Ukraine and the kind of the undermining of that kind of uh, logic of economic interdependence is that we are simultaneously neglecting what I think is the most important challenge that we collectively face, and that is climate change. The fact that you are about to move your capital city from Jakarta to somewhere else is a pretty good example of the direct impact of climate change on every country around the world. And the problem with the Ukrainian crisis, or one of them, is that we are being distracted from dealing with what I think is the most important uh, problem that we collectively face as a species. And that's the important thing. And if you're an optimist, the good news is that hopefully policymakers around the world will recognize that unless we cooperate, we've got no chance of dealing effectively with a problem that is planetary in scope. It's not something any single country can hope to solve on its own. So unless we act collectively, unless we act well and with consideration for other countries as well, then we're not going to solve that problem. And we're certainly not going to solve that problem when we're distracted by major wars uh, anywhere, but particularly in places that we haven't really thought we were ever going to see a major war of this sort again. So for people like me, it's been a huge surprise that we would see an old fashioned uh, war of a kind of traditional sort, seizing territory, trying to get resources, whatever it is that Putin thinks he's doing, that we would ever see that kind of war again in Europe, because we'd hope we'd learn that lesson from Europe's painful, previous experience in the 20th century and the fact that it should have been painfully obvious that that kind of war simply wasn't feasible or uh, had any real point or purpose anymore. But clearly, Mr. Putin didn't get the message, unfortunately. So we're, we're neglecting the environmental crisis. And I think this is the major security issue that the world faces. Uh, and we're not going to be able to deal with it while we're worrying about trying to stop an, an old-fashioned war from uh, breaking out. 
And this is a problem because it's a the climate change problem is a problem that we've never faced before, either as individual nations or collectively as a group of nations uh, organizing planetary resources. We've never had a problem like this before. We've never had to act in the kind of ways that I think we'll need to if we're going to do anything about it. Uh, but we're being dragged back into a kind of 19th or 20th century view of international relations and the way countries behave by uh, an autocratic leader whose agenda, it, to me at least, is not entirely clear. And it's not entirely clear uh, how we're going to solve this uh, particular problem, as far as I can see. So this is my kind of last slide. And this is a book that uh, Farris mentioned in his introduction that I wrote a couple of years ago. And this was me trying to be optimistic about the, um, the climate change problem. And I kind of wrote it partly, uh, well, in the hope that somebody might be influenced by it, but partly kind of for therapy for me, because I, you know, the, the climate change problem is a pretty depressing and uh, difficult problem to think about and deal with. And this was my kind of effort to think about some of the issues and problems that uh, are associated with uh, climate change. So the, you know, my kind of optimistic argument was that maybe uh, people other than just people, megalomaniacs like Putin, maybe Xi Jinping, whoever you think, people who are interested in trying to do something constructive and useful about the way that we address planetary problems and climate change in particular, maybe they will become popular uh, with uh, people around the world. And maybe people around the world will elect or bring to power in some way uh, other kinds of leaders who are actually interested in addressing the real kinds of problems that we all collectively face. And there have been some you know, mildly optimism inducing uh, examples of this actually being at least possible. The Arab Spring uh, five or six years ago, whenever it was, the Occupy movement in the United States when people rebelled against the uh, financial crisis, which was, uh, we can talk about that too if you want to, uh, and Extinction Rebellion, which is uh, in countries like Britain, Australia, a few others, uh, has helped to mobilize a sort of grassroots movement dedicated to trying to put pressure on policymakers, whether they're Democrats or autocrats, whatever they might be, to do something about climate change because they recognize, rightly in my view, that it's the most serious problem that we all collectively face. So we get a kind of, the idea is we get a grand swell from below dedicated to pressuring policymakers to deal with climate change uh, immediately because we don't have any time, which might be too late already, who knows, but we certainly don't have any time to waste. So we've got to do something immediately and dramatically. Uh, and maybe the only way to do it is to get uh, policymakers and maybe a generation of policymakers who understand the problem and are dedicated to doing something about it. And, you know, even Democrats like Joe Biden, uh, Joe Biden is not the youngest man on the planet and he's kind of even older than me. And maybe he comes from a generation that just doesn't get or understand or can get their head around the idea that this is something new, different, and has to be dealt with in a completely kind of different way as well. And Xi Jinping, he's well into his 60s as well. Putin, same age as me. All these men, uh, revealingly, just don't seem to get quite what a problem we're dealing with or should be dealing with. Uh, and that, in my view, is a, is a bit of a problem. There are some encouraging things uh, going on in the world. The so-called Green New Deal that's been talked about in the United States is potentially a good idea, even though it has an overwhelmingly national rather than international focus. In my view, if we're going to do this seriously, we have to do it on an international basis. We have to think about some of the losers from globalization and from destructive wars in places like Syria, Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia. Uh, they have to be 
part of the the agenda for dealing with the kinds of problems that we collectively face. And the reason for thinking about Europe is Europe is the only example, I think, uh, where that kind of institutionalized patterns of cooperation have been established, have been effective, and have actually made a difference. So you've, Europe's been peaceful, it's been prosperous, and they're trying to do something about the climate too. Uh, so that, I think, was a, a useful role model, even though many people in Asia don't like it. And certainly in ASEAN, they don't like it much. But if we're ever going to do anything about any of these kind of problems, I think that's the only way it's going to happen, by powerful organisations with institutional power being able to make big decisions about our collective approach to these kinds of problems and the priorities we attach to these things as well. So actively discouraging people like Putin from launching old fashioned wars, uh, if necessary, by even more sanctions and perhaps possibly threatening him with military retaliation, uh, but certainly by reorienting our collective efforts towards the real problems which are in the environment, I think. So I'll leave it there and I'll look forward to hearing your questions and comments. Well, thank you very much uh, for the uh, very insightful uh, uh, sessions, Mark. Uh, we have almost 200 students attending the <coughs> sessions today. So, but before I welcome questions from the students, allow me to highlight a couple of points that Mark already uh, mentioned before that. Uh, Mark uh, was taking us through historical trajectory of the European nations and how the region's legacy is not uh, explaining about one good picture, but the European Union has developed uh, into one of the most successful regional corporations which shape uh, the continent into a better and prosper uh, uh, regions. And regarding the recent crisis, uh, Max also mentioned a couple of points. First, at least this war has uh, made the European Union uh, uh, raise questions about the effectivity of the cooperation, how far the union might solve the crisis because we see the rise of the, you know, the, the triumph of national interests also in here. And second, about the uncertainty of capitalist peace as well. And the third, uh, also about the most important problems that we face right now is the climate change. The crisis, the Ukrainian crisis, absolutely making the climate uh, issues become uncertain, uh, become uncertain for the international uh, agenda. And the last is we also have to concern about the rise of a populism politics, because we have seen this uh, in a kind of politics in many countries, not only in Russia, but also in many parts of the Asian nations like China and even in Southeast Asia. And also uh, for the uh, session question and answers, I might welcome three questions first. Uh, for students who want to ask questions, you might want to raise your hands. Uh, I think you got the raised hands there. Uh, so I welcome students who want to ask questions. First, you might want to introduce yourself and then uh, point your questions. Uh, Mark, before the students' questions, let's start with the role of the United States here. Uh, I know the European Union joined the US in terms of the sanctions to the Russia and also brought the issue to the security uh, uh, to the to the meeting in the Europe uh, in the in the United Nations. So, wh what do you think about you know uh, whether the United States might intervene more uh, in this issue? Uh, and help the European Union, or you you might see that the European Union might act alone in solving this crisis. Uh, it's it's a good question, and it's a really difficult one to answer. I think the problem for the United States is that there's no easy or straightforward or obvious thing for them to do. I mean, the one thing they don't want to do is to risk World War Three, basically. So they're, I think, rightly concerned. That if they get directly involved militarily, then the stakes will be dramatically raised. And Putin has already talked about uh, 
the you the possible use of nuclear weapons in this conflict so i mean that's a pretty strong statement to say the least uh, whether he's bluffing we don't know but whether you'd want to call his bluff about this uh, is a is an interesting and important question and i think it's all important to remember that for joe biden in particular this is a real challenge because it's the biggest challenge of his uh presidency so far without a doubt and last year he had a disastrous withdrawal from afghanistan which undermined his strategic uh credibility in some people's eyes and i don't think he wants to make uh a similar sort of uh blunder uh possibly in this particular thing and i don't think he wants to get americans directly involved in yet another conflict when he's just made this tremendous effort to get americans out of a conflict which to be fair he inherited so there's great reluctance i think in the united states to get directly involved in this conflict they're very keen to supply uh some material for the ukrainians and to en- encourage other people to do similar sorts of things but i think there's not much appetite on the americans part to get directly involved now the europeans don't have any choice in some ways because it's happening on their doorstep uh and some of the uh european uh, countries directly uh border the ukraine and the polish for example are having to take uh many many uh refugees from ukraine ukraine so they're directly involved in this uh, crisis whether they want to be or not and as i mentioned in my remarks germany's being directly affected because its economic uh well-being is threatened by uh its reliance on soviet energy uh soviet russian energy so uh, the the stakes are very high uh and i think we hope that uh the good thing to come out of this i think has been that it's increased uh western european solidarity mm. the european union countries have come together and are trying to act collectively which is a good thing however it's taken a geopolitical crisis to bring this about and that's not a happy state of affairs because that was how this institution the european union came into being after a major cataclysmic uh crisis during the second world war and it seems to take another one to get them to act co- cooperatively and collectively in this particular set of circumstances as well so the great challenge i think not just for the european union is to recognize that we need to think of ways to bring about this degree of cooperation and uh coordination at a general kind of level without the need for a major war to bring people to their senses as it were that they need to do something uh urgently and collectively so we got to hope that we learn a lesson from this one again but you know the unfortunately the historical record seems to be we never learn anything from history but who knows Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, all right, uh, let's uh, welcome question from students. Uh, okay, uh, there is a question from Tehta. Okay, Tehta, time's yours. All right. Hello, assalamualaikum. My name is Tehta Arsha Pradipta. I am uh, first year in the international relation, Universitas Muhammadiyah Yogyakarta. And I want to ask you, Professor Mark Pisson, Do you think why we don't put much of effort into climate change is because of the capitalism system that we use uh, that put national interests above the collective interests? That is my question. Okay, that's no, a good question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tata. Okay. You got the question, Mark? The, the, the question about uh, the relationship between capitalism and climate change is a really interesting and important one. And I think it's it's a bit sort of tragic and ironic in some ways because uh, I think Karl Marx would recognize uh, that capitalism was a fantastically productive system and the best system we've ever come up with collectively for generating stuff consumer goods uh, increasing living standards wealth particularly in some places uh, wealth distribution has always been a problem and that continues to be a problem because one of the problems about capitalism is that within countries and between countries wealth gets to be highly concentrated uh, amongst 
elites, either in the north or the south or within countries. And that's a problem. And the, the underlying driver of capitalism is economic expansion, consumption, utilization of resources. Unfortunately, these are all things that we simply cannot do in the way that we once did, because there's a limited number of resources to use, and that we know by using things like coal, oil, other things, they're going to make huge contributions to CO2 emissions, and that's going to increase global warming. So again, we face an unprecedented dilemma that we have a very effective system that can produce stuff, albeit unequally, uh, but even that model cannot be sustained now because it's going to destroy the planet. It's as simple as that, unfortunately. So either capitalism has to be radically reformed or we have to think about quite a different kind of way of organizing economic activity internationally. And that's going to be quite a challenge because we've never done it before and we don't have uh, an effective model for actually doing that. So I'm not wildly optimistic about our chances, but I don't want to depress the audience. So I'll, I'll just leave it there. So, but it's a good question. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Teta, for the question. Uh, another question, please. Uh, is there any other students want uh, to raise the question? There is one student who wants to ask a question. He wrote the questions uh, in YouTube, Mark, because our sessions actually live in Zoom and also in YouTube. There are more than 60 uh, viewers in our YouTube right now. The question is, I'm not really sure directly related to our core topic, but his question is about China's sanctions to Australian coal industry. Are you okay with that question? Sure. Sure. Now, the, the relationship between China and Australia is a good illustration of what I was talking about, about yeah. the rise of geoeconomic power and the willingness of some countries to use their economic leverage uh, to achieve uh, political ends and to pursue their national interests and to suppress criticism of their policies. Mm -hmm. So that's really kind of interesting and important. Having said that, uh, I'm afraid when we're talking about Australian foreign policy and domestic policy, I feel a great sense of embarrassment because Australia is one of the richest countries in the world. Uh, it has lots of advantages that other countries simply don't have. And yet uh, it is one of the most selfish countries in the world because it's the, one of the biggest producers of coal anywhere on the planet. It expo exports a lot of it to China and other countries as well. And we know that coal is one of the key contributors to CO2 emissions worldwide. If Australia was serious about being a good international citizen, which it isn't, by the way, but if it was, then the first thing it would do would be to shut down the national coal industry. The crisis of climate change is that serious that we have to do pretty well unimaginable things to address the kinds of problems that we face. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to deal with them at all. And the consequences of that will be even more alarming than some of the things that are going on in Ukraine. But that's what we're kind of up against. Each country has got to rethink its sort of attitude to the international system. So it's not just Russia and China that we should be looking at and criticizing, but it's Australia. It's the United States. Maybe it's Indonesia too. Maybe you shouldn't be chopping down all your natural forests uh, and putting up palm plantations, palm oil plantations instead. So, you know, there's lots of things we could criticize in every country, but every country's got to think about this and step up and do something useful. Thank you, Mark. Since you also mentioned before about the Indonesian moving capital, the follow up questions from uh, the same. Uh, students it was actually about the moving of capital, innocent capital from Java Island to uh, Kalimantan. Uh, the question is whether this is will be raising issues about environment because might argue that this is also part of the how the you know some elites controlling resources over there. Yeah, well, it's it's an interesting. I mean, you you all know more about what's going on than I do, but as an observer looking from afar, the the significance of this a bid to move the capital. I think it's just a good illustration of how everybody's 
politics and everybody's decisions about domestic policy are going to be dramatically affected by climate change, even in Australia. I mean, you know, our government at the moment is not the most enlightened or sophisticated government in the world, I think it's fair to say. But even they now recognise that, you know, the country is on fire every year. We have terrible floods. Uh, Indonesia, you have, you know, Jakarta is regularly flooded. So people recognise that the assumptions that they made about policy in the past are simply not going to work. And they are being forced to make big, uh, difficult decisions that they might not want to make. I'm sure uh, Jocko, Jocko uh, doesn't want to... Daughter. Doesn't want yeah, to yeah. move the uh, the capital from uh, Jakarta because it's going to be a big effort, costs a lot of money, uh, and it's a kind of indicator of how bad things have got that you need to do that. So all policymakers everywhere are being forced to make these kind of difficult kinds of decisions, uh, and it's illustrative of the kinds of challenges that we already face. But if we don't do something very, very rapidly, these kinds of decisions may look uh, relatively easy compared to some of the ones we'll have to make in 20, 30, 40, 50 years time, when the big problems might be about illegal migration, about people wanting to escape from places that are simply uninhabitable and unsustainable for human life. So that's gonna be where uh, old fashioned questions about interstate war, to dealing with uh, unwanted migrants, et cetera, et cetera. They're gonna be really painful and difficult uh, policy questions that are gonna make today's issues look pretty uh, okay by comparison. So. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, there's another question here uh, from uh, Asik Alahi. Hello, Asik, do you wanna raise the questions directly? Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you for the opportunity and thanks to Prof. Mark. I'm a student of international, re international relations, fourth semester. So uh, my question is, uh, uh, we have seen that Euro Europeans have been engaged in war actively uh, outside Europe, especially in uh, Middle East, uh, as well as uh, uh, other places. Uh, also, they, they have been actively supporting Israeli aggression uh, to a Palestinian, and now it's so unfortunate that they are seeing war in their own re region. Mm. And in all those uh, matters, we can see that uh, European are being led, being led by uh, US, uh, as well as uh, we can see the NATO expansion, which is um, uh, protested by uh, Russia. And despite uh, Russian uh, protest, uh, uh, US, uh, US is uh, doing the same expansionism and uh, trying to control others, like uh, controlling uh, Putin. You also mentioned about uh, controlling Putin and others. Why it has to be uh, controlling? Why it's not a cooperation, like uh, peaceful coexistence? Thank you. And uh, no, excellent question, and not an easy one to answer. But uh, but uh, you know that's one of the problems about the. You're right to point to the relationship, strategic relationship between the United States and key allies, some of whom are in Europe, in places like NATO. But Australia is a key ally of the United States as well. And uh, the unfortunate recent history of American intervention in the Middle East uh, has catastrophic long-term implications because uh, the first thing that Putin, Xi Jinping, anybody else say when America criticizes them is, what about Iraq? You invaded uh, another sovereign state uh, when the United Nations said you shouldn't do it. Uh, you went ahead and did it unilaterally anyway. And uh, it's a really powerful counter argument for anybody in the world who doesn't want to be inhibited, who thinks they have a right to behave in the same kind of way. So I think it's absolutely right to criticize the United States for foreign policy disasters, like the unnecessary, unforced, unproductive invasion of Iraq, which was clearly a disastrous historical mistake. But that doesn't make Putin right, doesn't make China right. And the other thing is when, uh, countries uh, decided to uh, get involved in Libya, for example. I think the uh, 
the the thinking was quite well intentioned because Gaddafi wasn't a nice man, didn't treat his people well. And there are plenty of other examples of people around the world, uh, leaders who haven't uh, behaved well, do terrible things to their own people. And the question is, if there is such a thing as the quote unquote international community, and that's a kind of separate debate, maybe there isn't, maybe that's part of the problem. But if there is some such a thing as the international community, what are they supposed to do when leaders persecute their own people, do dreadful things? You know, there's plenty of people in the world now, Venezuela, North Korea, uh, some of the things that are happening in uh, Yemen at the moment. There are plenty of places that are in a terrible state. And the question is, should anything be done? Could anything be done? Who should do it? Now, in an ideal world, perhaps the United Nations would organize some kind of collective response to these individual security challenges, and maybe we'd get greater support, greater happiness about the way that those kinds of things are being dealt with. But we don't have a good record of doing that. The United Nations has famously got internal problems of veto by the uh, Security Council members, including Russia. So they can't really, we don't have a mechanism uh, an institutionalized mechanism for doing things of that sort. And, you know, maybe the North Atlantic Treaty Organization for all of its problems is about the best we've got in this particular situation at the moment, because at least it offers some kind of collective response to what I think most people would agree is an unfortunate state of affairs, Putin invading Ukraine. I mean, the, the you know, the, the pity is that there wasn't something similar to discourage the United States from invading Iraq, uh, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, when that would have been an equally good outcome uh, for the Iraqis, but also for the United States, because it cost a lot of, cost the Americans a huge amount of money uh, and a huge amount of loss of prestige and soft power in the world. And people like you, rightly criticize the Americans for some of their policies as a consequence. So they, they've they undermined their own ability to affect, uh, to act effectively in the world. And Joe Biden and other people are still trying to deal with the aftermath of those disastrous decisions of 20 odd years ago. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, I believe this is the end of our time. Uh, I would like to address uh, to all of our more than 200 audience combining Zoom and YouTube. And also thanks to the faculty, uh, Dean, uh, Dr. Takdir Ali Mukti, and Vice Dean, Dr. Yani Rosilawati, and also the head of department, Dr. Sagita, and also uh, Dr. Ari Paksi for organizing. Uh, before we close, Mark, I will give back to the Master of Ceremony. A really man. pleasure to meet you, Mark. It's, it's been a, more than four years we, we Indeed. haven't Indeed. met each other, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, I'll give back to the Master of Ceremony. Okay, uh, Mas Andy, are you there? Uh, yes, uh, yeah. Mr. Faris. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, finally we get to the last sessions in this program, that is closing. Let's close these programs by saying Hamdallah. We would like to say thank you to the speaker, Prof. Mark Beeson, our moderator, Bapak Faris Alfadat, and the participants. I apologize for any shortcomings in presenting these programs. Uh, I am Andy Firmansa, and the entire committee would like to thank you for your attention, and wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you. Bye-bye. Really, really pleasure. Thank you, Have Professor you. Mark Bison. Nice to meet you. Have a good, have a good day. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.